Backyard Farmer is a co-production of NET Television and Nebraska Extension. Tonight on Backyard Farmer, we'll aerate the lawn to help it thrive this fall, and we'll show you how to store chemicals properly. That's all coming up next, right here on Backyard Farmer. again and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. We're glad you could join us for another hour of good gardening. We've got a couple more shows left this season, so there is still time to get your questions emailed and get those pictures to us as well. Our email address, byf at unl.edu. Do let us know what's going on to the best of your ability. Do please remember to tell us where you live. And if you've got some time this week, why not check out Backyard Farmer on our social media pages, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. As always, we start the show with samples. Rock, you brought a bag of leaves. You are so, you should be a horticulturist. so observant. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kim, for, for, for pointing out the obvious. Um, so this is a bag of leaves, and you say, why would the turf specialist bring a bag of leaves? That's because it seems this time of year, you know, we start getting the leaf fall and people start worrying about having to pick these things up. But the, the good news is, is you don't have to, especially if you've got a mulching mower. Mulch them back to the surface. Um, work at Michigan State clearly shows that you can have to have, have to two to three inches of debris on the surface that's leaves, grind it up with a, with a, a recycling mower or even your standard mower, let it fall back to the, to the ground. Now, what are the benefits of that? Well, there's some nutritional value, but the amazing thing is, is if you have maples, you get a little bit of broadleaf weed control out of the, what, they don't know if it's a chemical in the leaves or what, but you, they do show clearly that you get some, some activity on broadleaf weeds. Oak leaves, for a lot of people, they say, well, no, I can't put on oak leaves. It'll turn the soil acidic. Well, after six years, the data from Michigan State clearly shows that they're not going to, um, they're not going to acidify the soil. The only thing we wouldn't suggest mulching back is pine um, needles because they could, but for the most part, pine needles tend to make that dense mat under a pine tree, which is just the natural mulch that makes it um, healthy. So, and once again, those leaves don't need to be picked up. They can be ground back to the surface. Um, and if you've got a really deep pile blown up against the side of a tree or a, the side of a planting bed, just kick them out of there and get them spread out a little bit. And if they're a little bit on the dry side, they're going to mulch up really nice. Excellent. And it's a lot quicker to mow if you don't have to empty that bag. Well, that's a great point, Kim, because yeah. it doesn't, you're not stuck. Yeah, if you don't have to stop and pick them up and, and mm -hmm. they don't have to dispose them, there's all kinds of environmental benefits as well. There we go. All right. Amy, those do not look like they'd be good baked. No. I was a little disappointed when I pulled them out of my own garden. So um, I don't know about everybody else, but I'm busy digging up my potatoes. I dig my potatoes as I use them. I don't have a huge potato production in my garden. But as you can see here, I got some potatoes that are looking pretty gross and nasty. And so the big thing is, as we're digging those potatoes, taking a look at what we're looking at, especially if you're going to be storing them throughout the winter for the next few months. So when you first look at this potato, you're going to see a lot of different holes in here. Um, associated with it. And the trick is when you first look at these holes, you might go, wow, I have wireworm issues. Why did I have wireworms um, or insect feeding? Here's another one with some holes in it. This actually isn't even insect damage. This is what most people commonly call it is pitted scab. It doesn't matter if you call it pitted scab, uh, corky scab, everything is the same. It's common scab. This is a fungal disease that actually is in the soil and it affected the tubers as they were being set on. Why we get some variations in how the tubers react to the scab depends on environmental conditions and varietal differences. So the trick with this is this one here, as you can see, is pretty, pretty darn nasty. Now with the scab, you can still eat it. You're going to peel it. But with this one, if we take a closer look, you can kind of see there we're starting to get some red discoloration in there we're starting to get some fusarium dry rot in there. And so if we put this into storage, that fusarium dry rot is gonna to continue to grow in that tuber. And when you go to peel it and cut it in half, there's a good possibility if you didn't use it right away, you're gonna end up throwing away about half to three quarters of this tuber because it's nasty and gross. But with it being dry rot, it's not gonna get soft and smelly. It's just gonna be a dry, dry rot. And you're gonna notice it when you peel them open. If you have a problem, a lot of times we're going to look at moving stuff in the garden, um, but 
Keep notes of what cultivar you had or variety because maybe you don't want to use that one next year if it was really, really susceptible. You might want to change them out. And I know this year it was hard to find seed potatoes just because of the demand. So take a look at what you ended up with this year and maybe plan ahead for next year. Excellent, thanks. And yeah, no, not eating that. <laughs> All right, Sarah, you have beauty. Yeah, um, I brought along some coleus cuttings because this is the time of year uh, to start thinking about taking some cuttings. If you have some coleus or even some geraniums that you would like to propagate, uh, and grow over the winter than to have to replant in your gardens next year. The, the beauty about coleus is that they are so easy to root from cuttings. So all you have to do is take about a, a six or maybe an, even an eight inch cutting. Um, then you wanna remove the lower leaves and the lower shoots so that everything you put in the soil, you can even take off these big lower leaves like this, just pinch them off so that you're left with this. Then you're gonna get some kind of a container. It could be a, a paper cup, could be a, a yogurt cup you're gonna recycle could be um, some potting, uh, some containers that you had from this spring that you've cleaned and sterilized, um, anything like that, and make a drain hole in the bottom of it and fill it with nice clean soil, potting soil. Um, another great thing about coleus is you don't even have to dip these in a rooting hormone to get them to root. They will, you just put it straight in the soil, keep it moist, and it'll root for you in about, about a month to six weeks. Very, very easy to grow. Um, if you have a, a cutting like this that is starting to get a little flower head at the top, you're gonna, to wanna, you're gonna to wanna to pinch that off so that you don't have any flowers on there. Then once you put this in your growing container, what I would do is put a Ziploc bag over the top of the container to hold the moisture around your cutting. That's really gonna help in the first week or so uh, to prevent excess water loss and prevent your cutting from wilting. But these will grow root and grow and they'll be all ready for you to replant in your gardens in the springtime. Now, but one, one caveat I wanted to, to note, a lot of gardeners are seeing white flies in their landscapes right now. Um, I was out in my garden and brushed up against some peonies and I just had a cloud of white flies that flew up off my plants. So you wanna do a close inspection of any plants that you're going to be taking cuttings from and bringing indoors to make sure that you're not bringing any uh, white fly hitchhikers along with them. White flies are kind of a general feeder and so they can also infest your house plants. So you might wanna separate these plants from, from the rest of the plants in your house kind of an isolation chamber to make sure that you're not bringing any bug issues. After you've had them inside for two or three weeks and you're not seeing any issues, little tiny white gnats that fly up off the leaves, then it should be okay um, and you shouldn't have to worry at that point. But really, really easy to do softwood cuttings at this time of year. You wanna get it done before frost. Excellent, and that way you get the ones you want just in case they don't have them next year. That's right. What about mm -hmm. store, where, where do you store them? In the basement or in the, anywhere in the house? Or? They, they could be cool. So you mm -hmm. wanna have them someplace where the temperatures are between about 65 and 75. You do need to make sure that they have some sunlight. That can be natural light from a window or it could be from like a fluorescent um, shop fixture that you've hooked up to create a little growing uh, zone. So natural light or, or fluorescent light, either will do fine. Excellent, thanks Sarah. All right, uh, Rock, your first two questions here, or two pictures are brown spots in a fescue lawn. This is in Waverly. He's wondering, is this animal urine or fungus or what is this exactly? Showed up mid late August, a dozen spots with stunted growth surrounding the spots. And you got it because Amy already had too many questions. Well, and that's fine because I think she would agree that it's not, um, not a pathogen, not based yeah. on that appearance. That first one is a classical urine spot. Um, where was the viewer, did they say? Waverly. Waverly. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we've got kind of a coyote problem. That looks like the, mm. the, the Coyotes tend to dribble. The males do when they urinate and they, they'll make a trail like that um, in the prairie as well as in your lawn. And so we have seen a fair amount of coyote sightings and coyote sightings in. So I'm gonna say that's an animal. I'm not gonna say that I can guarantee that that's what it is, but that's a urine spot. And one of them has a little bit of a continence problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right, your next one is, uh, this is Columbus and he says uh, bugs on, on broken grass. He thinks they're on clumps of brome, so I think he meant brome in, that, in his header there. They're only on that grass, and, and then it appears as though it's actually burnt. So what's going on here? Well, th these, these are actually ants, mm -hmm. and um, they're doing what we call swarming. And I, I didn't know this. I thought it was a hornet of some kind, but I phoned a friend, and our good friend Jody you know, immediately gets back to me and says, I didn't phone her, I sent her an email. And she says, these are ants and they're swarming. 
and swarming is when they wing up and get ready to go do the deed, right? And, and, and spread their seed, whatever you want to call it. So they're swarming. And um, it usually takes a couple, three days, and then they're done, and they move away. Uh, some of the discoloration, I don't know what that is. And I, yeah. that grass looked pretty healthy to me. That broom looked pretty healthy to me. So I'm yeah. going to say I don't really see that as being an issue. If they don't go in a couple, three days, then, then we may be wrong, but I'm pretty confident based on Jody's diagnosis that those are ants that are swarming. She even went on to say that she took a really close look, and she thinks they're citronella ants. And if they're citronella ants, guess what? They smell like citronella. <laughs> Imagine. Go that. figure. Yeah. So you can crush them up and, yeah. and and you get kind of a citronella smell and be watchful yeah. of their pinchers. And the burnt thing was just sort of odd. That was. I mean. I, really I wasn't odd. quite sure yeah. about that at all, but I didn't see any injury in the picture. So. Right. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Rock. All right, Amy. Uh, this is an Antelope Park, Lincoln <laughs> neighborhood. They have. Uh, they're calling it oozing out of the locust. A very large one that has been doing this for the last five to seven years. Some pieces are missing as well, produces seeds every year, has had a couple different opinions on this. And so I think we have a closer up picture of uh, that beautiful It's fungus. absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, looking at the pictures, it looks like it's like hen of the woods or chicken of the woods. Um, very common fungi that we see growing here. The trick behind it is what it indicates is that you have a heart rot in that tree. So with it being on the side where a branch was cut off, I would assume maybe that's where the fungus got into the tree to begin with. And so it's slowly growing and eating the inside of that heartwood. And this is the fungal structure, so it can produce more spores and it can go spread itself around the world. Um, so this doesn't indicate anything, you know, the, the fungus on the outside isn't a bad thing, but what it is an indication is the integrity on the inside of the tree is definitely being compromised. Mm -hmm. Now, the tree might look perfectly healthy on top because the heartwood isn't translocating any food, nutrients, or water to that tree. What's gonna happen is when we have a major storm event, wind event, ice event, this tree is more likely to break off. And that's where we usually look at those experts to come in and take a look to look at the integrity of that tree. And if it is a tree that has the potential of causing damage either to your home or to vehicles, and it has a little bit of questionable integrity, it might be one you might wanna consider cutting down, especially as we're going into the winter months. All right, thanks, Amy. Your next one is also a fungus. Uh, this is an mm -hmm. Omaha viewer uh, looking to identify this one growing on a maple. So this was uh, in June, and then after it bloomed, they think it's a jelly ear. And so I think they also sent a couple pictures on this one. They, what is that? They did. I was super excited to see this. So the viewer's right. Uh, jelly ears is one name for them. Uh, mouse ears is the other. It's a common, more of a gelatinous mushroom that produces. Once again, it's eating on the heartwood of the tree. Um, and just so you know, mouse ears is one if you would like to try it, go to a Japanese type restaurant mm -hmm. and you're able to buy them dehydrated. Um, so it's considered a delicacy. I do not recommend you to harvest them yourself. Go buy it from a very reputable uh, grocery store where they're dehydrated. They taste excellent, but they're really cool because they are really soft and squishy and jelly. Um, so once again, it's indicating that we're having a hot rot. You might wanna look at the integrity of that tree. Great, thanks Amy. All right, it's tree time, apparently. Sarah, yours are trees also. Um, your first three here are a sewered viewer. This is construction damage, uh, boring water pipes in, multiple problems, so they've dug all sorts of holes, removed some sidewalk. The concern is the damage that's been done to a 60-year-old maple. So they're showing in this series of three pictures how close they got. There's, they're wondering, is there anything they can do to help preserve this maple? Not really, um, <laughs> other than just basic care. I mean, obviously, they're going to fill the holes back in after yeah. they're done with their construction, and that's fine. They've done a tremendous amount of root damage to this tree, though, yeah. so there is concern that this tree could fail because it's lost all of this anchoring on, on the side where they've done the construction. Yeah. The only thing that you can do as a homeowner 
would be to make sure that this tree is watered during dry periods, make sure that it's mulched, the good basic things that we would do to try to maintain or improve tree vigor. Um, but there's nothing directly. I mean, you can't, you can't applying a fungicide is not going to help this tree. You can't fertilize this tree out of this damage. Um, yeah. So it, uh, it's definitely a concern. But think about water and mulch. If it stays alive next year or the year after, um, to try to help it as it's recovering. All right. Your next one, uh, Sarah, is one of five trees. This is a hackberry. Upper branches have been stripped. He's wondering what this is. Disease, damage, drought. Wondering if he should take this down as well. He wants to leave it for a couple of seasons. So, so what I would do if I were looking at this tree, you see that, that dead branch at the top where there is, are not very many leaves. I would look at the very base of that branch where it attaches to the trunk to see if there's some kind of physical damage. Have there been squirrels stripping the bark? Um, is there some old pruning wound that is rotted away at the base of that, that branch? To see if there's some physical reason that would explain why this branch has died. Um, and quite often you will find something, that there'll be something there that you've overlooked that would explain why this branch is dying. If that's the case, then you may just be able to remove this branch and the, and the, tree, the tree may um, still live for a long time and still have fairly good health. Um, from the picture, that's really all I can say. Yeah. Um, if we needed to do a more in-depth diagnosis, I'd see, need to see more, more close-up pictures so that we could look for fungal structures or, or disease in the foliage or the branches, cankers or something like that, or some kind of insect problem. But I would first just inspect that branch really well and look for physical damage. All right, thanks, Sarah. Well, your turf will greatly benefit from doing some aeration this time of year. Our landscape expert, Jeff Culbertson, will discuss some of the tips for doing it right for our first feature tonight. I'm going to talk a little bit about the why, when, and how of fall aeration. So the main reason that we want to aerate in the fall is to relieve compaction. You may not have noticed it through the year, but whether you've been walking through the lawn, you're mowing, running that wheelbarrow, chasing the kids, the dogs running around, all those things are compacting our soil, which restricts the amount of oxygen and moisture and nutrients that gets to our grass roots. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna aerate the, the soil in the fall here, and that will help relieve some of that. So if you've seen any standing water in your yard, make sure you make a point of that. We're gonna aerate those a little bit more. If you have a path, if you have some thinning turf, all those are places that we wanna spend a little bit more time on when we're doing our aerating. The also, the other nice thing about doing it in the fall is we're able to do some fertilizing afterwards. If you do have some thin turfing, you wanna do some overseeding, great time to do it right then. So the first thing we'll do is we'll go out with a screwdriver, we'll check our soil. That'll help kind of identify some really compact areas and also our moisture to make sure if we need to put some, uh, run the sprinklers a little bit, make sure we have some good moisture before we do our aeration. Uh, that'll give us an indication of that. And then we'll go out and we'll use our aerator or you may hire to have it done. And what we're looking at doing is making sure that we're pulling out plugs of two to three inches long. That, that's a, a good sized plug and that'll help kind of recycle some of that material. Um, and also that'll give us a, a nice space to do some seeding and our fertilizing and all that. One of the things that aerating in the fall will help us in the spring is we won't have to worry about uh, the weed germination that we might if we've done uh, spring uh, aerating. Um, so doing this in the fall helps that fewer weeds are germinating this time at this time of year. It'll also help with uh, greening up the turf a little bit faster in the spring as well. You'll notice when you've aerated the lawn, your turf is ready to go a little bit faster in the spring. So again, we wanna make sure that we do a good thorough job. We've identified those spots in the yard that we wanna spend a little bit of extra time over. Uh, it takes two, three, four days for the cores to, to break down. If they've dried out, you can mow over them and that'll help break them down a little bit faster too. So if you're, if you're worried about the mess, uh, you can do that. But let's not rake them up. Let's recycle that material back into our soil and that'll help get us off to a good start next spring. Like Jeff said, don't rake up those plugs. Let them break down into your soil. Don't walk in your really good shoes on that turf at the same time. And that practice also does help with thatch because the turf seeds get into direct contact with the soil. So good idea to do that. All right, Rock, here we go. This is suburban Omaha. 
pulled this weed out from the underside of a spruce tree without gloves, and then his hands reacted to it. So what do we think this one is? Well, I'm glad the viewer, it's a nettle, and, and I'm gonna say it's a stinging nettle based on the reaction to his, in mm -hmm. his hand. And um, these are, the, the, the false nettle is actually native and a great pollinator. The, the butterflies really like it, but this is a stinging nettle. So he wants to get that out of her, wear gloves next time. I'm not gonna suggest any spraying because it's in and around an ornamental bed. But uh, you can usually eradicate it relatively easy. It, it's, um, but just be careful and uh, you know wear long sleeves and that sort of stuff when you get it. Obviously, he got it out of there, but let's, him, he might have to stay on top of it. I wouldn't recommend a herbicide in that environment. Is it annual or perennial? Perennial. Okay, so he might have others hiding under the can. What I'm hope I'm, I'm hopefully optimistic that what he had was um, a one little straggler one that came done. in. A, a bird carried the seed or whatever. Good. But if not, um, if it gets any worse, give us another um, email and we'll r suggest a herbicide that may be a little more aggressive. But if it's a smaller infestation, certainly not necessary. Cool. All right, your next one, uh, we're not sure where they, oh, Omaha. Two weeds in the gardens that are close to the ground and of course then work their way into the turf, kind of. So what are they? They get worse as the season progresses and he wants to know how to control them both. Okay, the first one is purslane um, and it's a really fleshy, lots of water in them, extremely drought tolerant. You know, usually it's almost like a cactus in the way it responds, right? And it also reproduces, so if you go by, by segments, so just a little piece of that purslane, so you pull it up and you leave a little piece behind and guess what, mom may be dead, but the babies are all coming on with a vengeance. Um, it, it actually is relatively easy to control um, with pre-emergent herbicides. If, once it's up, it's difficult to control. So a product like Preen in the landscape bed or a good pre-emergent in the turf itself um, will do a good job controlling um, purslane. And your second one, I think, is also one that he said was in his in kind of the same location. Yeah, I think it's that fringe area between mm -hmm. the two. And this is right. spurge, um, prostrate spurge. Sometimes it's called spotted spurge because guess what? It has spots on it. Mm -hmm. um, it's got a milky sap if you break the, the stem. It also can be controlled pre-emergence in the bed, in the landscape bed with something like Preen or in the lawn with any of the Scott's Halts products or something like that. Um, Post-emergent, you can control this with 2,4-D containing products, but be careful since it is in an ornamental bed. All right, excellent, thank you, Rock. Amy, uh, mm -hmm. trees, your first one here is a Raymond viewer. So this particular tree is cracking, sapping, and has some fungus. And fungus among us on this one, should this person be concerned? He should be concerned. Just like the previous two trees, this is an indication that we have heart rot. Mm -hmm. um, definitely gonna wanna take a look at it. And you have a lot of fungal growth on here, so I would predict that the heart rot is fairly extensive. So one thing you can do if you don't bring a, a, a an arborist out to take a look at it is if you have a long drill bit, you can drill into that trunk of that tree. If it's solid all the way, you're gonna continue to feel that resistance. If you run into a heart rot, what's gonna happen is it's gonna go vroom, through it really fast. So it's a quick, easy way to do a quick diagnosis if you're not willing to have an arborist come out. Right, and I think you have uh, another tree potentially. Yep, mm -hmm. and this one says it's this viewer says oozing sap and has a crack in it. What is going on? So the one thing I wanna talk about is the green on the side. This is actually lichen, mm -hmm. which isn't harmful to the tree. It's just a saprophyte uh, that works with it. The cracks could be an indication of freeze cracks that are occurring with this. And the tree is weeping and sapping, uh, losing sap just because it's injured. Uh, recommendation at this point in time is just continue monitoring this tree. If those freeze cracks get worse, we can start seeing some dieback on the upper part of the tree because we're inhibiting and limiting that movement of water and nutrients in that tree. All right, and your next couple are boxwoods that uh, are exhibiting leaf yellowing and dying in couple spots, a couple adjacent to this don't. He's wondering, is this bacterial, viral, or environmental? Did they, I can't remember, did he say where they were from? Lincoln. Lincoln. So. One thing with boxwoods is, especially in a bed like this, how often you're watering them and if they're getting too much water. And with boxwoods, I'll see a lot of crown rots associated with them. And so I'll see dying of the inside of that boxwood, turning brown and then extending out. So would really suggest getting in there, t taking a feel of that soil. If you have rock in there, rock really doesn't help. Uh, those boxwoods, it's hot. 
Um, I would really recommend removing the rock and doing it in an organic mulch. Uh, it allows things to dry out much better than the rock. Right, and we did see some boxwood damage, I think, with twigs and everything else this winter. So mm -hmm. it's kind of the nature of the beast. It is. All right, Sarah, this is, this is really, your first one's a really fun picture. Uh, she plants celosia every year in her pots in her garden. She had a bunch of volunteers come up, uh, colorful, gorgeous. She said one is a wonder, measured, had a diameter of an inch and a half at the base and grew like a tree. Yeah. And um, is this, she's wondering, is this unusual? This is Lincoln, but her mother lives by Schubert, Nebraska, 87 years old, watches the show every year and also loves Celosia. So is this unusual? Um, no, not really. I mean, some of the Celosia um, or plants in the Amaranthus family can get very thick stems, almost woody, the way that you're describing. So, and they can get quite tall as yours did in this picture. So, um, you know, since these, you allowed these to grow as volunteers, um, they wouldn't have the same genetic makeup as whatever the parent plant was that you had originally. So they might revert more back to sort of the wild genetics or the wild DNA, which, which would be, you know, a taller and, and more open uh, and back to the, um, uh, the spike heads instead of, it, I, I'm not sure what you had first, if you had the, the crested heads or, or if you had these spike heads, but um, um, this is, Yours are obviously very healthy, but no, I wouldn't say this was particularly unusual. All right, thanks, Sarah. And then you have a couple of IDs. The first is from Grand Island, uh, planted it several years ago. Can't come up with it. Baptisia. Is it Baptisia? Okay, yeah, this is the first time I'm seeing this picture. So it, mm -hmm. I, Baptisia stems usually are, are thicker and, and not as viney looking as this. Mm -hmm. um, but um, uh, false blue indigo is a common name for Baptisia, and it's it's a great tough uh, perennial, a very drought tolerant once they're established. And then I think your next one is Hastings, and it's what is this flower? Oh, this is um, Missouri primrose, right? Uh, which is a great uh, low growing perennial, also very drought tolerant, uh, uh, and prefers full sun. So it's it's kind of a nice ground cover if you have a really tough site that's very hot and dry. Excellent, thanks, Sarah. Well, as we wind down our season on Backyard Farmer, our garden is still going strong. We're still donating a lot of produce. Fall color is starting to set in. So let's take a minute to hear from Terry James out in the Backyard Farmer garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're looking at all of our fall crops that we've planted. They are looking fantastic, um, starting to get some real growth on them. Looking forward to having some of that fresh, kind of what we always normally think of as spring produce for the fall. We're also looking at making sure that we're getting all of our cover crops in. We're turning over our compost piles. We're adding that compost getting rid of all that dead dying that's in there. Remember, don't put that diseased plant material in your compost, throw that into the garbage. But make sure that you're getting your fall garden ready, get it prepped, get it managed, turn your soil over, get that soil going, and stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out. The Backyard Farmer Garden on East Campus is really a great destination for those late summer, early fall walks. Everything looks fantastic, especially considering we didn't get started until June this year. We do need to take a short break. We'll be answering more of those gardening and landscape questions right after these messages. You're watching NET Television. Welcome back to Backyard Farmer. Coming up later in the program, Matt Soshek will help us figure out how to store those chemicals properly over the winter. Do remember, we're not taking phone calls tonight. You can still send us those pictures and emails to byf at unl.edu. 
Right now it's time for the lightning round. Sarah, you haven't been lightning for a while. No, so not we'll for a while. see how you do. Okay. All right. Uh, this is a viewer who puts a lot of soil over the crowns of their daisies to raise the beds. He's wondering whether he can expect the daisies to come up through it or whether this might smother and rot them. I think once you get too deep, you're going to start to smother them. So it would be better if you took them out built up the bed and then replanted them or transplanted them back in. All right, uh, this is a North Omaha viewer who says, why are there so few walnuts and acorns in North Omaha, but there are plenty apparently in Midtown? Is it temperature, do we have any so, idea? So I think what happened is that the flower buds on these trees died back in, I'm trying to remember when exactly it happened, I think it was April. We had fairly warm temperatures and then we had a week where temperatures were back into the, the, the teens at nights and then we had, we had snow. I think the flower buds died in that, that incident. But it, it may be that in Midtown there was enough of a temperature buffering effect by being in the city that there were a few, a few degrees difference and those flower buds didn't die. So those, those trees still went ahead and developed acorns. Excellent. This is a North Platte viewer who collected wisteria seeds from Washington State, put them in pots. They grew. Will wisteria survive in Nebraska? Uh, it, will, it will. Yes, it's winter hardy, um, especially the American wisteria. It's going to be a long, long time before you see flowers, though. <laughs> a long time. I mean, years and years. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Sarah. All right. Amy, are you ready? Yes. This is, uh, this is a Carney viewer who wonders whether a, a soil-borne disease could be brought into the garden from a compost topsoil mix. So it could come in on the topsoil. The compost, if it was ran correctly should have been warm enough to kill any soil-borne pathogens. All right, this is a Nebraska City viewer who wants to know how to dispose of the apples that have diseases so they don't spread next year. How do you dispose of them? You can throw them into a compost pile as long as your compost pile is coming up to temperature and it won't impact anything next year. All right, um, this is an Omaha viewer who wonders whether they can shred leaves from trees that had anthracnose and use them as mulch. I wouldn't have a problem shredding them, um, just due to the fact that we have so much anthracnose in the environment. Mulch them, help get your turf out. All right, uh, we have several people who are saying they, they have powdery mildew now. What do they do about it? Powdery mildew is one of those things, leave it alone. Uh, at this point in time in the season, I wouldn't bother with it. Uh, you could go ahead and start cutting it out if you're looking at fall cleanup of your landscape beds. All right, excellent, nice job. You ready? Sure. Okay, this is a Fremont viewer who wonders whether now that we're going into cooler and supposedly wetter conditions, should the turf be cut shorter than they cut it this summer? Set it and forget it. Set your mowing height at the beginning of the year and don't ever adjust it. All right, we have a Council Bluffs Iowa viewer who is wondering how to control what he's calling grass burrs. So I assume that's sand burrs. He's been fighting this for 20 years. Yeah, the trouble with the sand burr is, is grassy sand burr, especially in, in, in Nebraska, is that it's, it's really difficult to control and some of the pre-emergence will work, but it's got to be really later in the season because it germinates so much later. So your first application will miss it and then the second application will be too late. So if sand burr is what you're targeting, delay that first application as much as possible. Clearly measure soil temperature and make sure that you're at, at about the 60 degree or higher rate for several days in a row. All right, we have a North Platte viewer who wants to know whether it's a good idea to aerate buffalo grass, and if so, when? It's always a good idea to aerate just because soil's compact and you increase air, you increase root growth, you increase health. All right, um, we have a when to fertilize a super, super turf to lawn in Lincoln. Um, you, you can, you know, if you go to the four-step program, there's obviously a fall application. Just in the fall, make sure you don't go into ground that's frozen and no later than the second week in October. Excellent. All right, Sarah, plant of the week. All right. Nice job, all. That was not real lightning, but it was really good answers. <laughs> in depth, in depth. In depth yeah, lightning. Right. That was that rumbly lightning. Yeah. <laughs> well, two, two beautiful additions to our fall garden. The, the one in the center is actually my favorite of the goldenrods. You know, typically when we um, think of goldenrod, we think of the plants that have those kind of open splayed heads. This is Wichita Mountain goldenrod, and it grows um, as a very upright perennial shrub with these, these tall stems or spikes, and all of the little flowers are, are produced along the spikes. So it doesn't have those open heads that you traditionally see on goldenrods, you know, uh, planted along the, or growing wild around, along the roadsides. 
Um, this is a, a cultivar that was discovered in the Wichita Mountains in southwestern Oklahoma, and that's where it gets its name. But you'll find it as a great perennial in the garden centers in springtime. Then these little yellow daisy flowers here uh, at the bottom, this is a false sunflower. Summer sun is the name of this cultivar. And um, a, a great thing about both of these plants is that once they're established, they're very drought tolerant. Um, so they don't need a lot of care. They're gonna be pretty easy to grow and um, also great for butterflies and pollinators. So um, two great additions to the fall garden. Right, and that perfect sunshine. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Sarah. All right, Rock, uh, this, this one is actually a, a seed mix bag and it was used to overseed a thin lawn in the Donovan area. Mostly sun, not very good soil, kind of that sandy soil along the, along the river. River, sure. They're wondering whether this will work or should something else be added to it. So if you look at this list, it's kind of a laundry list of cultivars. It's gonna take a little longer and I'll try to accelerate it, but there's a lot of the fine fescues in there. Mm -hmm. Fine fescues in general do not do well in Nebraska and they definitely don't do well in, in even half sun, full sun because they are shade tolerant, but they're prone to diseases. So you look at that and over half of that bag is the fine fescues. There's a fair amount of perennial ryegrass in there and perennial ryegrass is not a perennial in Nebraska. It tends to die from the winter or die from the summer heat. And it's also coated seed, which has always intrigues me. I personally don't like coated seed because I don't think you get an, any benefit out of it, but you do end up having to seed at twice the rate because 50% of it is this coating, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not disparaging this particular mix, but I'm gonna say that number, and the seed tag is white, which means it's not certified, but it still has to be true to type there. And it's also got some weed seed in there, although at 1%, but when you consider in a pound and some of our weeds can have you know, hundreds of thousands of seeds, well, even up to a million seeds per pound, then that would, could still be enough to be a problem later. So I would say that they probably need to look at, um, you know, if they wanted bluegrass, go with a pure bluegrass mix, um, where they're located on that sandier soil, a fescue mix, a turf type tall fescue mix would be far better. But I think they're gonna be very disappointed in the performance of this particular seed bag on that location per their description. All right, and your next one is actually a fertilizer label. So they're wondering, is this the right fertilizer for fall? So we're looking at a marketing thing here and it's got really pretty pictures, but we don't know the analysis. You know, right. we need to look at how much nitrogen, how much um, phosphorus and how much potassium are in there. Those are the three, first three numbers on the bag. And it really isn't the first, you know, the first number tells you how much nitrogen and it's about how much you put down. Mm -hmm. So if you're on a regular fertility program, um, certainly, you know, if it's a 20% nitrogen, and I'm guessing that that might be what it is based on my knowledge of these consumer products, you know, then if you put on five pounds of that per thousand square feet, you're getting one pound of nitrogen. We certainly don't need, if uh, on a lawn that's older, we don't need that much nitrogen because it already releases enough nitrogen in its own. So if you want to go to turf.unl.edu, Bill Kreuzer did a really nice job describing uh, fertility rates and it's you, know, you can download that for free or look at it online. But that, once again, that's turf.unl.edu and look under turf info. And that one was posted, I think two or three weeks ago. All right, thank you, Rock. Amy, mm -hmm. uh, this is a South Sioux City viewer and said this was really fun. Found this little gem in the front yard. Um, he thinks it's a columbola. What kind of a mushroom is this? He's never seen mushrooms in this type of the lawn before. He just couldn't mow it. He couldn't mow it, really. Um, it is not a columbium. Um, I would, it isn't in that category. It's very similar. This is one of those mushrooms. There's so many of them that you actually need to do a spore print to actually know what species it is at this point in time. It's really challenging. Most likely what that fungus is doing is eating up that thatch that you have there. So it's a good guy. It's converting it into that nitrogen in that older lawn that you don't have to put fertilizer on. <laughs> Your next one is an ash tree that has a lot of branches die this year but and thought it was the boar but then saw this on all the leaves. This is Midtown Omaha. What is this? So this is actually ash rust. Mm -hmm. And so when we look back to our spring, we were wet. We were wet, 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 which really pushed for this disease development. And ash rust is notorious for causing premature defoliation, but it also can girdle the petioles and some branches if we get severe infections. So we'll, we'll see those ashes looking a little rough. 
Overall, it typically doesn't kill the tree, but it can weaken it for some winter dieback, um, depending on how hard of a winter we have. All right, and your third one is, is a powdery mildew question. Is this powdery mildew, can it, these peonies be cut back now, and how do they keep it from coming back next year? This is Fall City. Well, this is definitely powdery mildew. Uh, nice white powdery, if you take your fingers and rub across it, it will come right off. Powdery mildew is one of those, it likes lots of humidity. Sorry, you live in eastern Nebraska, you have humidity issues. That's all there is to it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's one of those things, you just kind of live with it. You can spray it with direct water to help reduce it. Most of the time, I don't recommend a fungicide application to control it. Now, can we trim down our peonies this time of year, Sarah? Absolutely. Good do time it, to do it. Do it and be done. Do it now. Get rid of it. <laughs> I want to say, I've been thinking about it in my own garden. I just yeah. haven't gotten to it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Excellent. All right. Thanks, Amy and Sarah. Uh, yours, Sarah, is actually an O'Neill question. Mm -hmm. And this is a 67-foot line of lilacs planted over 25 years ago, tangled mess. How and when should they clean them up? So I would say the ideal way to do this would be to go in and prune out the heaviest stems and take them as far down as you can. And you could do that now or you could wait and do it in, in March. It doesn't really matter since you're gonna be taking out entire stems. That's, and then you would do that, you would repeat that process over the next three years until you completely cleaned up this line of lilacs. I like the staggered method of pruning because it's not a shock to the plant. You're not cutting all the stems down at once and then asking the plant to grow completely back. And what I find is when people cut lilacs down severely, they tend to cause the lilacs to sucker a lot from the base. And so you'll end up with this, with more and more suckers of new stems coming up from around the base. Um, but that said, if you don't want to do that, if you just want to go in and cut the whole thing down at once, um, you can do that. Uh, you know, you'd probably go back to about 12 inches or so on most of the stems. Um, I would wait until the plants are dormant and then do it sometime between November and March. You won't have any flowers for next year, probably very few for the second year. They'll have some the third year, um, but you'll be able to get it all done in one shot. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, this is an Omaha viewer for your next couple. Uh, Sycamore has this thing they're calling, which is actually a gash in the trunk. It was tossed around violently during the windstorm, a windstorm, but otherwise it was healthy. They're, they're hoping that this is nothing to worry about. Well, the thing about this is that this looks like old damage to me. This doesn't look like anything that just happened recently. And the problem with trees bark is when the bark dies, it oftentimes takes a year or more before that dead bark becomes brittle enough and, and, and loosened from the underlying heartwood that the bark itself will fall off. So I'm wondering if this bark has been dead for a while and this windstorm caught, caused enough movement in the tree that it, it caused this bark to be loosened and fall off. So what I would do is I would do more investigation to see exactly how far back the bark is dead. Um, you might go in there and pull off if there are some loose flaps of bark, pull that off until you can get back to where the bark is tightly attached and, and you can see where it's still alive. How much bark is dead is gonna be critical to determining whether this is a serious problem. If just from that, that quick picture, it looks like you have a fair amount of dead bark. It may even be 50% around the tree. Um, so yeah, that's a serious issue. Right. Uh, I don't know if this tree will survive or not. Right, thank you, Sarah. Well, as the growing season winds down, you probably have a few bags of half full fertilizer, perhaps some insecticides or some fungicides left over. Storing them properly over the bitter months that we have ahead will ensure that they are just as effective next year as they are right now. So here's Matt Soshik to give us some tips on chemical storage. Uh, with winter coming up, we want to be thinking not only about how to take care of our lawns or our landscapes, but we also want to make sure that the products that we're using for those landscapes uh, are stored correctly and that we're going to be able to use them next year or, you know, we don't want to overpurchase, so we have to store these chemicals for many years uh, so they're not going to be as effective uh, from year to year. Uh, so some of the tips to look at, you know, when we're using chemicals for treatments to our lawn, uh, you always want to read the label. Uh, it, usually on the last page of the label, it does state how these products are to be stored and to be disposed of. So 
Some of the products require that they do not freeze. So we want to think about if we're storing these chemicals in our garage that's not heated, they're going to freeze and we're going to use them next year. They're not going to be as effective. So if I'm out there making a treatment, I want to make sure I'm using the correct products uh, the right way. So I don't want to be wasting my time and wondering why this product didn't work in the following year when it worked last year. Uh, so not only, you know, different products have different labels on them. So here's one, just Bassagran. Uh, it's used for uh, broad leaves and nut sedge. And it says, do not let get below 32 degrees. So this would be one we do not want to freeze. Uh, I have another one here, uh, Tenacity, that's used commonly in seedings. Um, the liquid version, and this one can be stored down to 20 degrees below zero. So there's a difference in products and a different in how they're to be stored. So just look at the label, usually on the last page, it does give you a recommendation on storage. Um, not only are we gonna be storing maybe some chemicals, but also fertilizers. Uh, fertilizers might also have chemicals on them. So if we're storing those, usually the labels do state to make sure that we have them in a dry or cool area. And you wanna make sure that if you open up a bag, that it's well sealed, so rolling it over nice and tight, maybe putting a couple pins on there or clips so it does stay tight and moisture cannot get in. Because usually the main problem we have with fertilizers is moisture getting in them and then they become hard and crystallized and stuck together. And I have an example of that. I have some uh, urea here that's got big chunks in it. This was obviously left uh, to expose to the air. And usually in the summertime, it happens when we have high humidity, gets in these bags and it'll, it'll cause them to be ruined. Uh, so you also wanna make sure you don't have any punctures in the bags or anything like that. So I would recommend even putting them in a seal tight container in the bag, roll them up, stick them in there and you're gonna have a lot better chance of storing them through the winter. Uh, not only do you want to you know, make sure that we're buying enough product for our lawn, if you do have leftovers, try and use that up the following year. I wouldn't recommend keeping them more than two years uh, because you never know if it's going to be as good as it was when you bought it. Same with chemicals, two to three years, uh, that's probably the max I want to go. As long as you're keeping them in good conditions, they should stay good, but past that, four years, uh, I would tend to find a disposal site for that and get rid of them and start over with some fresh chemicals. We cannot say this often enough, that label is going to tell you everything from the proper amounts to application as well as storage. Before you open and use that chemical pesticide, read and follow those instructions. That is the law. All right, Rock, your first one is, um, this is an Omaha viewer. She has identified this as one of the fountain grasses, and she's seeing that this is considered a noxious weed. It goes into the turf. What do you think? Well, I, I know it's not a noxious weed. It can be, it can be aggressive and get into the turf, but it's, right. it's actually a gorgeous ornamental. And, um, and the, at, the, at the end of the day, it can shatter that seed and then get into the lawn. The, the beauty is, is that unless she's uh, pesticide averse, uh, anything, the products that contain quincrolac, which is a post-emergent product for crabgrass or the trade name Drive, do a great job on fountain grass. A seedlings in the lawn. So if they're willing to do that, other ways they just have to cut them back before they put their head out, um, which is kind of contrary to the beauty of that plant. Right. Um, or they can divide them and put them further back in the ornamental bed. Um, and then if they, you know, and hopefully you'll get less in, in invasion of that weed. But they're not noxious. They're not, if they were noxious, you would have to by law control them, and that's not what they are. All right, excellent. Uh, your next one is an ID, and this is an Omaha viewer. Good guy or bad guy? Uh, that's a bad guy unless you live in the south. <laughs> um, that's Bermuda grass. Um, the stolons, when you get that really aggressive stolon there, and and you know the viewer can't see this, but they have a fringe of hairs around the ligule and the oracle section there. Um, and if it if it it might have been zoysia grass with similar characteristics, except zoysia um, uh, doesn't have that wide a leaf blade nor that aggressive a growth habit. So I'm pretty confident this is Bermuda grass. Um, there is no selective control, so it's spot spray with Roundup and be careful for the injury to the non-target species. All right, and your third one here is a Grand Island viewer. What is this? How does uh, it get controlled? Uh, that's Nimble Will. Um, and the beauty is, is that if you reach deep into your pockets, you can buy a product called Tenacity, and it works extremely well on this, but don't be sticker shocked when you Google it and 
it comes back for a little eight ounce bottle with a fairly hefty price tag. But it goes down at really low use rates and, to, and, and nimble will is difficult to control so it'll probably take multiple applications. And other people in your neighborhood probably have it. So if you're a good neighbor, you find a way to buy one bottle and everyone's your best friend and you get invited to barbecues with beer. <laughs> Socially distanced. <laughs> All right, thank you, Rock. Uh, Amy, this is uh, a viewer who thinks she has blight, late blight on her tomatoes, and there's these little brown spots. She's been organic gardening for okay. eight years. This actually isn't late blight. We haven't had the right weather conditions for late blight. Late blight likes it cool and wet, uh, which we haven't been. So most likely we're looking at, it's really hard to tell from the picture. It could be bacterial spot. It could be some anthracnose. I would need to see the tomato fruit itself a little bit better. All right, and this is Hastings, but they haven't been any They have. They haven't so. been wetter or cooler. So it, late blight likes that 60 to 70 degree weather that, and wet, wet, wet. Think of Ireland, because that's where late blight comes from, that we haven't had those conditions. All right, and then your second one, Amy, is uh, this viewer has been trying raised garden beds in the Millard area, new soil. She, she did spray for the little white flying bugs. Pepper plants were stunted through the summer and the peppers are very small. She's, she's wondering about this and then of course she wonders whether she can use these in salsa or anything. Um, I am absolutely stumped. Um, these do not look like peppers. That top one kind of has the bottom of a pepper but the top of a lemon. Um, more pictures, more information. What variety of pepper is this supposed to be? Is it a bell type? Is it an Anaheim? Um, and maybe just, if you're in the Millard area, even dropping off a sample at the Douglas Harpy Extension Office and having them take a closer look would be really valuable here because I am stumped. And, and eating that doesn't look like a good idea. I want to eat no. it just because I don't know what it is. Right. It may not be a pepper. I, it's a big fat question mark for me today. All right, thanks, Amy. Um, this one, Sarah, might be a question too. We only got one picture of this. It is, uh, what is this? It was found in a yard in Bellevue. What yeah, we so I can't see the leaves very well in this picture, which is the problem. My, my, my one guess is that this is an Amir maple seedling, but I don't know, that's just a guess. Um, when you send us pictures of leaves that you want us to identify, it'd be really helpful if you, if you took the twig and you laid it on a piece of paper and you, you, you spread the leaves out so that we could see them really well, that would really help us to identify it. And with, with trees, the, one of the identification characteristics we're looking at is how are the leaves attached to the stem? Mm -hmm. Are they alternate on the stem? Are they opposite on the stem? Then, of course, the shape of the leaf is critical, too. So, you know, if, if there's only a few of these, I would hand pull them. Um, if they're mostly small, um, you might be able to do that. If there are some taller plants that are getting fairly woody stems, then you could do a cut stump treatment where you just cut the stem down as much as you can and then carefully paint the cut stump with concentrated Roundup. That'll move into the root, root system and, and kill the whole plant so that it, does, it doesn't come back again. All right, thank you, Sarah. Um, your next one is actually came from two different viewers. So you have two, two different people who sent this. Cleaning up the area across the street, notice these somethings mm -hmm. on the vines. Are they seed pods? What, what do we have? And this is from both viewers. Yep, absolutely they're seed pods. And the shape of those seed pods sh should give you a hint as far as what family they send because these are milkweed seed pods. So this is the vining uh, species of, of milkweed. This is called honey vine milkweed. Um, so, I mean, it can be somewhat of a, a prob uh, problematic weed. So um, I would probably just pull the, pull the vines out and get rid of them, get rid of the seed pods so that you don't have all those seeds uh, in your gardens for next year. Right, you do get the beautiful smell. Yes. And you get some butterflies. And right, there and is some, there is some get, habitat value. And right. then you get a lot of honey vine. Yes, <laughs> exactly. And it comes back next year and brings friends. It does bring us <laughs> friends. It, you know, it's a, it's a, just a honey of a plant. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, an announcement of a still a fun thing in the gardening world as we wrap up, uh, get close to the end of the season. Our Grow Big Red virtual learning series is still going on. We are putting the garden to bed on this last one, which is go.unl.edu slash growbigredvirtual. Tuesdays at 7 p.m. through September. So great fun, and I know that we've had a lot of great participation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, we have just a minute for a question or two, Rock. So this one comes to you. Uh, a couple viewers have sent in a question saying they've had their art 
yard aerated. They are going to overseed. They want to know how much and how often should they water for the overseeding on the lawn. Yeah, and if, where are they located, they say, I'm sorry? Um, they didn't, but I know we've had a couple from Lincoln area, a couple from maybe York. Yeah, so the projection for long-term range for rain is not really good, and mm -hmm. too bad they didn't do this a week ago when we had four days of overcast right. weather. So right. they, need, they need to put water on that in an established lawn that they've overseeded at least twice a day until they see the, see the seed pop out of, out of the ground. In fescue, that would be roughly five to seven days, and bluegrass would be 10 to 14. Um, and until then, they've got to keep that seed bed moist. If we get any rain or the temperatures are lower, um, which they're not supposed to be in eastern Nebraska for the next four or five days at the very least, um, so they need to get the water on it at least twice a day. The nice thing is, is the existing turf, because they overseed it, it's not bare ground, does a nice job of cooling it and, and, and shading it. So it's not like a new lawn where we're saying, you know, three to five times a day. All right, thank you, Rock. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for Backyard Farmer tonight. We want to say thanks to our audience for all those questions you submitted, also to our panel for another great show. Next time on Backyard Farmer, we'll give you some tips for planting bulbs. You'll want to pay attention if you want to see these beautiful blooms popping out of the cold soil in the spring. So good night, good gardening. We'll see you all next week right here on Backyard Farmer. <music>